All right. Praise the Lord, everyone. So excited to hear every one of you as you are worshiping the Lord. Just, you know, there's nothing more sweeter than the presence of the Lord. It says, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus, to take him at his word. There's nothing more beautiful than that. And what a glorious, glorious uh, blessing, uh, inheritance for us to be in Jesus Christ to have that fellowship with him. You know, so um, as you've seen in session one, you know, let me take a step back. I first want to just thank you guys for having me to share with you from the episode of The Efficient because I've never done a study, honestly, on uh, epistle. So this, more than anybody else, I would tell you it helped me because I would be dwelling on this uh, episode. I wasn't looking at it as chapters. I would be looking at it in its entirety and being able to just read through it and just, you know, go through it again and again. So it starts internalizing, right? So you know what are the different aspects that are covered in each of the parts of the letter. So thank you for doing that because it challenged me and it has opened up my eyes to what the Lord has been speaking to us you know, when you take the whole counsel of what God is speaking to us. Amen. So session one was all about knowing your identity in Christ. Who are you? Right. We looked at who God called you to be. And then we looked at, you know, what Christ has accomplished for you. What is the hope of your calling? What is the glorious inheritance in the saints? And then we went into that power of God that works in you to live that life that God has called you to be. You are called to be sons. You're called to be heirs with Jesus Christ. He has seated you in heavenly places with him, is what his word said, not on your righteousness, but by what Christ has done even before you were born. So how glorious is that gospel, right? So in Ephesians chapter three, we learn that we are to be rooted and grounded in that reality, in that truth, in Christ's love. And then we start exploring the greatness of his, uh, his purpose in our life, the height, the width, the length, the depth, and you're not to do it alone. You're to do it with all your fellow believers. So everybody will find, uh, have a different dimension of God that they experience, which they share with you, which enriches your life. Then we did chapter four, which meant in light of that, um, you know, revelation that God has given you understand that you didn't do anything to receive what Christ has given you. So you, you and I are called to walk humbly, right? We were called to walk in humility because everything he has done, we were just recipients of his righteousness when we believed. It's not us, right? So we covered that. And then we talked about unity. When you realize that we are called to walk in humility and it is what Christ has done for you, then you look at all your brothers as co-heirs, all your sisters as co-heirs. We are all in this journey together. There was something very important that we said in the last session was also that, you know, we are to maintain the unity of the spirit. Pay attention to this. We are all called to maintain the unity of the Holy Spirit till the unity of faith is attained. Why is that? Anybody you want to get, have a quick go at why do you think that is the case? Why do you think the scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 that we are to continue to be one in Christ till we all attain to the unity of faith? You want to give a shot? Okay. If not, I'll just tell you. So this is the thing, right? All of us are in different, in different paths, in different, no, let me call, not call it different paths. There is only one path, but we are in different, you know, le uh, levels in the journey. So, you know, we might, some of my, us might be starting the journey. Some of us will be you know, a little further ahead, but it is the same spirit. It is the same power. It is the same gospel. It is the same Lord. It is the same father that has called you, that is working in you and in them. So we are to be patient and kind to one another so that we can all grow together into that unity of faith. But very important to that is the unity of the spirit. 
And that's what we covered last time, right? So we talked about walking in humility, walking in unity. And lastly, both of that leads to walking in maturity, right? We are all called to grow into that fullness of Christ. You know, when you read that when we are in the unity of faith, our ultimate goal is to be in the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That is Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13. So now we have broken it out into a different section. Now people do this differently. Some of them will still continue it as a walk in, you know, uh, here it will talk about walking in integrity, walking in purity, but we've really broken this out from chapter um, four, verse 25 onwards, we've broken that out into witness. And there is a reason for that. Because when you start reading this portion, it is how you interact with others. Till then, what you're reading about is how you are to walk it is how your life should be, you know, um, molded. So it's in humility. It is in unity, growing into the maturity of Christ. But what is that for? It's for your witness. So we're going to talk about witness. How do you interact with people? And we have broadly classified this session, okay, into four things. One is witness in the church or the body of Christ. We are all the body of Christ. Second is witness to the world. Look at those words. It, it is very important. Witness in the church, the body. Witness to the world. The third one, witness in the family. Oh, and then witness at the workplace. Or you can call it to the workplace. You can put it how you want. But these are the four sections where Paul starts to address it. Because now that you know what Christ is see what that life looks like in you and I, right? So getting into it, the first one, the witness in the body is, is really about integrity in our relationships. So it's all the way from verse 25, all the way to verse 29. So we've classified it in that manner. So first thing, it talks about your motive. Right, it says, therefore, laying us out falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. This is not talking about the world, this is talking about you and me as being the body of Christ. So, take this example for a moment. Right, imagine if your eye decides, man, again, taking the example of the eye, the leg is not important. Uh, you know what, leg, you just walk left. Um, I know that you're not supposed to be walking left because you're going to hit into that wall. But, you know, just take left because even you feel like you need to go left. What's going to happen? You're going to hit your face on that wall. You're going to fall. You're going to be either with a sore eye or a broken leg, whatever it happens. But what's getting injured? The whole body. It isn't just one person. And this is where it is important that we need to be speaking truth into the body because only by speaking the truth are we drawing. Remember, we are drawing everything. Look at your Bibles. Keep your Bibles open. Ephesians 4.15, it says, But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. So we are to be drawing the truth from Christ. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when we speak falsehood, we're teaming up with somebody else who's known to be the father of lies. Right? John 8, 44, Jesus was speaking to the Jews and saying, even though you think you know the scriptures, the way you talk, the way you are actually responding to the truth of God's word is as though you believe the lies of the devil and you're speaking the lies of the devil. 
they said we are abraham's descendants parambiryam you know nan satya christianiya njangale veetle moonu neram prarthane undu you know nan adu cheynu i am doing this project i am doing that project but really the truth is where do we stand in christ and that's where it's important that you take care of the body by speaking truth into it because when we start speaking falsehood our body gets aligned the body of christ which is supposed to edify gets corrupted with the lies of the devil and this is why we have to be careful we in the last session we also talked about being careful about teaching being careful about doctrine pay close attention to what we are studying and learning keep an open bible keep an open bible so that you can always reference and ask questions i think we should take times so hopefully we'll have some time today where we can ask questions but very important that we speak truth into the body the other aspect here that is addressed is emotion you know i've written here anger is one word away from danger when the devil is in the anger right the d in the anger the d in the anger is the devil in the anger see you know uh jesus was angry and you know many people use that as an example right jesus was angry towards the the pharisees the the rulers the the teachers of law in the temple because they had turned the temple into a marketplace he of course whipped out the lash he tore overturned tables we know that the anger of the lord was burning but what was the goal of that anger what was the goal of that anger to purify to purify and he's god you know there was a time jesus spoke to peter and said satan get behind me you do not have things of god in mind but things of man how you know imagine if you were just a minute ago called by jesus the rock kephas and on you you know the church is going to be built and the well, uh, the gates of hell is not going to prevail against you and in a moment jesus looks at him and says satan get behind me i mean that would have been just like a hammer in his face right but what was it done in it was done in love god loved peter even when he betrayed him he still he did not look at him with condemnation he looked at him with love he restored him in love our anger even when we are angry and some of us are parents you know sometimes you get angry with your children sometimes you might have a brother or a sister in the lord you find them just just going so wrong and your heart is burning what do you do then you don't speak out of your emotion but you you channel all that um anger and uh, how do i put it it can be a godly anger in the sense that you are out of compassion out of great earnestness for the person you will speak to them but any time anger is driven as a reaction to a situation there is danger in it because you are allowing the devil to have a seed in your heart genesis 4 6 and 7 all of us know the story about cain you know it says cain's face fell when you can't look at your brother in the eye and still correct him your harboring anger that means there's danger the d in the anger you know god tells cain cain why is your face cast down don't you see that sin is crouching at your door friends there are many things in anger we say that we regret you know i have i have i'm not going to uh, say that i have been excellent at this i have spoken with much anger many times and there are things that i regret about and had to confess and i had to be reconciled and i had to be making sure that i bridle my tongue god calls us to be why is that because that one thing can be a hindrance in your witness in the body it takes great effort to build something but it only takes a moment like this for it to crack so be very careful so it says don't let the sun go down on your anger there are times you will get 
perturbed, you will get disturbed, you will get frustrated, you will get disappointed, but learn to pray over it. Don't speak in the emotional rush of the moment with, you know, the person. Take time to pray. Ask the Lord to speak to you. Don't go to God with your justification. Ask him to speak to you. Pray and then speak to your brother. It says, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Okay. Then what else? It talks about unwholesome talk. It says in, um, so keep your Bibles open. Um, here it says, verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment. Unwholesome talk. You know, many times we think about it just, you know, rotten talk or whatever you want to call it. The actual translation of that word means rotten, like rotten tomatoes, like you can't, it stinks, right? But unwholesome may also mean something that is not whole, right? It's a half truth. You know, today we are in a world, this is so apt for the time that we live in. If all our conversation is going to be around, oh, you know, the situation is so bad. Yes, we have to be empathetic, but we don't live in empathy. We live in the power of God. We live in the calling of God. We live in the hope that Christ has given us. And if that is what is in our heart, that is what we speak out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So here's the question. What is the kind of word and talk that is coming out of our mouths? I want you to turn your Bible to Isaiah 50 verse 4. If there's anyone who can read it, it will be nice. Isaiah 50 verse 4. If you have it, just read it very quickly. Sovereign Lord has given me a well instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He awakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. Amen. You know, I'm going to read my version also. It says, the Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples. That's very powerful. An instructor tongue, a, um, a mentor tongue, a tongue that has been conditioned it says that I may know how to sustain the weary one with the word because we don't have the word. How do you have it? It says, he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. So friends, for our talk to be edified, we need our tongue to be conditioned in the presence of God. Hallelujah. So there are many debates, right? So people say, is it a good time to pray in the morning? Is it a good time to pray in the night? Which is the most effective? I will tell you, pray at all times. In the night, even before you go to sleep, Lord, thank you. You know, even when you're lying on your bed, you talk to him. That's what David did. He said, when I'm lying down, I meditate on all the faithfulness, the steadfastness of God, the works that he's done in my life. And in the morning, in his presence, condition yourself because you're out there to face another day. And let him condition, let him teach us his word. Let him condition us with his word because then you will have the right word for the right season. Even when people tell you things are going to go bad. It is still the wisdom of God that will enable you to say, but in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Amen. It's, it's very important that we are called to that. Finally, this is a very interesting one, right? So um, it says here in verse 28, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need. I, how many of us actually think we steal stuff, right? Do you consider yourself as a thief? No, right? None of us. But here's the thing. You know, 
we we are uh, you know involved also in speaking to you and many times i feel a sense of entitlement causes us to become very relaxed about our responsibilities let me give you an example this might not apply to everybody so there's two aspects to this i'm going to talk about so the first one is in the the physical realm that we speak about <clears throat> when you come home do you actually take time to you know clear up your clothes do you wash your own clothes i know this sounds so though so silly right but there are homes where our clothes are all around the place the person who comes in either it's your mother or father who has to behold your amazing laundry you know the sights to see can be your pants your shirt all of the things for them to take care of your plates are in the sink waiting for somebody else to wash it it can be something you know to do with where there is an opportunity for you to contribute in the family and we are not even in the realm we are not even there to understand the need we're so blind to the need of home stop using other stuff others are not meant to do what you are supposed to do it's our integrity in our relationships work labor with your hands paul was a person who labored with his hands in many churches he said i never i never burdened you guys he told the galatians i never burdened you guys i worked with my own hands to provide for my needs we must have a heart to you know work so that our witness even in the body of christ is right you can't be going around doing uh, you know whether it's singing whether it's preaching whether it's doing all this program and your house looks like a mess somebody else's responsibility someone else's stuff to take care of your stuff no we are called to hello we are called to be um you know contributing now here's another aspect i want to bring to you as well we are all sitting together studying god's word but if all that we do is become sponges listening to others of what god has spoken to them we will never grow in christ we must and stop stealing so you know in today's world even for me to share this word with you i can go and research on the internet and you'll find loads of things that you can share from but that is not going to help me in discovering what the holy spirit had to speak to me yes we should re- use references i'm not saying that we shouldn't use references but we must invest time in studying god's word rather than taking the easy way out bailing ourselves out with somebody else's hard work that is stealing labor and love i want you to note that verse in first timothy chapter 4 14 to 16 you know paul is telling timothy timothy i want you to indulge yourself in the word to the reading of god's word i want you to take time to be absorbed in it take pains at it give diligence to it we are called to study god's word take pains in it and this is why i was telling i want to thank you guys for allowing me to share the episode of efficiency to you because i have been dwelling on this and i'm so amazed that every time you read it god just pops up some another thing another thing if we are ready to listen god will speak so stop stop stealing stop having someone else to do what you're supposed to do labor in love and share it to the needy because you know once you start walking in that revelation you know when you're taking somebody else's and giving it there's no value there's no excitement about it in some cases there will be i'm not denying that there might be something that impressed you that you shared but imagine when you read it and it just leaped at you what are you going to do are you going to keep quiet about it you're going to share with others what god has spoken to you in that word isn't that what you do when you have a testimony also that you share something god spoke to you 
that is sharing with the needy. There's somebody out there who has to hear what the Lord has spoken to you. And this is why in Ephesians 3, it says that we together with all the saints will, you know, try to discover the love of God, the height, the width, the length, the depth. It's not somebody else's responsibility. It is my responsibility. It is your responsibility. It is our responsibility together. Okay, so witness in the body. Why is it important? You're going to see because unless you and I are enriched in God's word, we will be like, you know, just like sponges sitting there. There's nothing that happens. One, once the sun comes up, that water dries out of the sponge. No, we have to grow. We need to be drinking from that river. All right. So grow up. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think it's a very important message to us, right? Speaking the truth. Don't be afraid. If you love the person, if you genuinely love the person, sometimes we are scared to speak truth, right? But do the truth in love. There is no fear in love. Amen. First John, it says that there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. Don't let anger get in the way. Let our talk be wholesome. Let it be the timely word. And let us Invest time in the word, invest in our relationship, invest into our responsibilities and grow up in that integrity because the witness in the body is important. Okay, so here's something else. Grieving the Holy Spirit. So right after that, interestingly, Paul goes into something we, we suddenly feel, oh, why is he saying that? In verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You know, I've uh, written something out there, the nerve center of the body of Christ. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says that the spirit knows the things of God. And it also says that the Holy Spirit makes intercession on our behalf with groans that cannot be uttered. So he is the connection. When Jesus, when, was he, when he was being taken to heaven, he said, I'm sending you the comforter. Because he's your connection with Christ. So all the instruction that comes from the head, which is Christ, comes through the Holy Spirit to you and I. It is he who reveals the word to you. And it is he who takes your prayers. And if you're praying in the spirit, will take it and make it according to the will of the Father. So that God's will is unveiled in your life. He's the nerve center of the body. The instruction comes from there and from the rest of the organs. It goes back to the head from the nerves. So, Jesus kept his side of the promise. In John 14, 26, he said, I am going, but I'm going to send you the comforter, the counselor, the advocate, the helper. There are many Terminology is that word, comforter or helper, advocate, or all of that means in Greek, it means that same word. He's all of that. He's teacher. He kept his side of the bargain. He, he has allowed the Holy Spirit to be within you. It is so important to understand this. That is why Paul is telling the church, do not grieve the Holy Spirit because why? He's with you. Many times we don't realize that he's with us here. He's with you where you are. If you have accepted Jesus Christ, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit and he's in you. So how are we treating him? And this is why Paul told him, grieve not the Holy Spirit. If we walk and stray away, he's grieved as a father, as the father with the prodigal son. You know, you and I can claim our inheritance. You know, you know, let me see if I can do things in my way. What does it do? It grieves the Holy Spirit because he is there to help you. Imagine if you are mentoring somebody, if you are helping somebody and you know that person needs help, but they still choose to do their own thing. Does that grieve you? Does that make you sad? Because you know what they're going to do is going to be absolutely crazy. And it's not going to help them. 
and then you can do nothing but stand because you cannot enforce yourself on anybody. The Holy Spirit will not enforce himself on you. You know, uh, I remember when we were doing this altar call with uh, last week, I appreciate your prayers because we had a wonderful altar call with the CSI church. And um, this is something very powerful. One of the questions one of the students asked us was, why did even God put the fruit in the garden if he knew that man was going to sin? That's a great question. It's an important question. Right? He never took away the choice from us. If God was going to create a perfect place where you did not have a choice to follow him, because choice comes from love. If you are a robot, there's no love. You're just programmed to do whatever you're doing. If you write, I know there are people who, among you who are coders, who are computer engineers, you write codes and it will do exactly what you, almost always, it does exactly what you want it to do, right? But then we are not coded to just be robots. We are created in the image of him. He's a God of love and choices have to be made in love. So he will not enforce himself. He didn't enforce himself. Don't you think God the Father knew? Don't you think Jesus knew? Don't you think the Holy Spirit knew as Eve was biting into that fruit? Couldn't God have come and just, you know, uh, swapped off the fruit from her hand? No. It's all about choices. He will never enforce himself on you. So choice is very important. So Please pay attention to this. I'm going to read it out as it is written. The partnership in the journey with the Holy Spirit is your choice. Man, that's, that's really critical. The growth that you and I have as believers and all the things that the Holy Spirit has given, whether it's in the fruit of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, is completely on you and me. How much we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our life. It's all done. He's already provided for it, but are we allowing him? And that is meant to be represented in our relationship with others. Just think about this for a moment, right? What happened in the Garden of Eden? We're going to come to that, but remember there was a relationship that was broken. So it's very important that in Luke 15 also, when that son decided to go away from the father, there was a relationship that was broken, cut off. But God is always there waiting every single day for us to return. All right. So then it talks about our witness to the world. This is purity. So this is from chapter five, right? It talks about imitating Christ. Therefore, uh, you know, whenever you have therefore, it means there was something before that, right? You will see a lot of therefore in this epistle. Paul keeps saying therefore, 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 because one is connected to the other. Unless our witness in the church, in the body of Christ is perfected, the world will not see it. John 17, it says that they may know me by seeing that we, they are one as we are one. We all sing that song, right? We are one in the spirit. We are one in the law. And what does it say? And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. So now your representation to the world is imitating Christ. What does imitating Christ mean? It is that same Holy Spirit. Remember chapter one, where he said it is the same power that was exerted into the physical dead body of Jesus Christ as he was lying in the grave, raised him up on the dead. That same power is available to you and me if we believe. To those who believe, it says, and then it says, you're adopted. Your sons, your daughters, you're, you will belong to the family of God. You're representing the family. Uh, you know, some people say, Nyan a kara, Nyan e kara. We are of the family of Christ and we represent him. 
inheritance, your position in Christ, servanthood as Christ, all these things are important. Your inheritance, you, you just need to go back and recall all these things that we've already covered, right? So you are to represent this to the world. The people need to see what it is to be a Christ IAN, a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, and living from the position that you have in Christ, serving as Christ did. All right. So conduct. So guys, we need to also address the elephant in the room sometimes. Sexual perversion is the most pervasive problem among Christians today, youth and adults, uh, you know, uh, alike. It's almost heartbreaking. I was reading an article in Gulf News Day for yesterday. So was reading about these things called LOL dolls. I never even knew. I mean, I'm just so, you know, we don't have children, so we don't know all these dolls and things. So it was so hard to see how sexual perversion is even being, you know, passed into little children, toddlers, little girls or, you know, or, or boys, whoever play with those dolls, it has perversion built into it. And this is exactly what Sir, Satan wants to do. If he can't attack you from the outside, he will make you to have a conflict on the inside. As dangerous as pride is, because pride is hidden to other, uh, is hidden to yourself, but evident to others, sexual sin is the opposite of that. It is very visible to you. You know it, but it is invisible to others. But in Revelation, Jesus speaks to the church of Thyatira that is corrupted. And he says, him that has eyes of fire, he knows all things, sees all things, hears all things. You know, in Habakkuk, it says the beams of the house are going to shout out what we've done in secret. What do you want it to shout out? What do we want it to shout out? So remember that we have an identity with Christ. We are no longer that old man. Refer slide 30. The reason I'm asking you to refer slide 30 is it talks about a depraved mind. It all starts here, guys from the mind, then you start feeding the mind, which becomes our understanding. You get cut up from God. The lights are off because you no longer are feeding your mind with the things of God. Our heart becomes hardened. And then we start behaving in sensual way. Slide 30 covers that. Go back and see it. That is the reason that there's so much of sexual perversion because we keep flirting with that old guy. There's absolutely no friendship there. So then, uh, here Paul says in verse 4, and there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of ta thanks. Trash talk. A good tree cannot be... Uh, you know, bring, uh, apple tree cannot bring out grapes. A banana tree cannot bring out jackfruit, right? We are all from, mostly, everyone's from Kerala, right? So, um, you know, pana kanda tonda, vada kola kanda tonda, chakeda maun kanda tonda, right? It's not all the same. You can't expect, imagine a jackfruit hanging from a banana tree, it would break. It's not meant to be. So we, as children who have that new man identity, I, I want to remind you what I shared last time. Do not ever associate yourself with the old man. That is not you anymore. Once you've accepted Jesus Christ, you're a new man, a new woman in Christ. And we need to hold fast to that. Oh, there is no my in the old way old way has been cut off from you. And anytime that comes back, you have to distance yourself from it. And God, the Holy Spirit will sanctify your tongue. We talked about it, right? If you're conditioning yourself with the Lord, he will cleanse your tongue. I used to do a lot of trash talk too, but God cleansed my tongue. I didn't know, I didn't even see it go. It just went. 
because when, once the Holy Spirit is inside of you, there is no inclination to speak those things. It's all available to us. It's all available to us. All right, let's keep going, guys. Why? We have been called separated and holy, right? We have been called and separated. So we have been meant to be the lighthouse. You're the lighthouse to the world. You can't have a glass that's shady to shine light to the sailors. You don't want them to sink, right? All right, so let's go to the next part. So how many of you know what this is? Anybody? What does it remind you of? I'm trying border. to keep it. It's a border. Amazing. Yeah. It is a line of control. Look at the amount of that barbed wires there and all those things that are pokey hanging out on both sides. It is a line that is not meant to be crossed. And this is very important because that's what Paul is saying in chapter five. Um, you know, when he talks about from verses five or uh, six onwards, he says that let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. You know, there's no shades of gray with God. There's either light or darkness. You were called from darkness into light. You are part and it says you are light in the Lord. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And his Life was the light of men. So your life will be the light of men. To many, you will be the gospel that lived before them. What's the gospel of Jesus according to, if you put your name there and say, what is the gospel according to Lee? Uh, what is the gospel according to Anish? What is the gospel according to Kevina? Yeah, what is the gospel going to be according to Jason? What is it going to be? What is it going to be the gospel according to Nibin? We are that one new man is not a hidden man. Guys, we don't have one, like we are not wearing different masks. This is, this is the new man. This is the real deal. And a new man is light in the Lord as he is the light of the world. It is from that identity we live outward. If you looked at how we started this session, we talked about witness. It is living inside out. Your new man is your actual nature and you live from that identity. Not the other way around. We don't have the, you know, it's not Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, Dr. Jekyll looking all nice. He's a nice guy, but he gets into hide in the night. We're not werewolves that transform, right? We are called to be that absolute new man all the time, all the time. All right, so what is the other thing? We can't have a shady hidden life and expect to get away with it. So I have taken the example here of Lot. You know, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says he was actually a righteous man. Even though of all the problems that he had with Abraham, remember that guy actually stepped out with Abraham in obedience to God to go to Canaan to go to the promised land, to the God, to the land that God was showing him. And he was willing to trust his uncle, Abraham. So he was a righteous man, but he was starting to lose focus. And it is that big price that he paid when he went and lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. It was very beautiful. Even today, when you look at, you know, for Israel from the uh, look from Israel into the, the plains of Jordan. It looks so beautiful. It's not at all amazing why Lot would have fallen for it. And here's the thing. His nephew just escaped with the skin on his back. He could not even save his wife. Can you imagine the regret that he lived with? Whose choice was it to live in Sodom and Gomorrah? And who paid the price? Of course, she had an active role in, you know, turning back and looking at the stuff that she left. But it all started with him making that choice. There's nothing, there is no compromise. Friendship with the world is enmity towards God. James 4.4 4 says that. Let us be sure of that. There is no pally-pally in this. 
And what are we talking about here? This is also something that we need to understand. Jesus did not say, oh, you know, go and live on another planet. We're talking about a world system that does not honor God because its king is the devil. You know, I follow, and I'm sure some of you, um, you know, follow the U.S. elections. Um, I am not a big fan of um, any party, but there are certain parties at least that try to follow what God says. And there are some that are just absolutely, I mean, it's just like you cut new in roads. Everything is okay. Everything is okay. You can't talk about, you know, um, homosexuality because people will not, uh, people will think that you're a bigot. There are people that will consider you stupid because you hold to the faith of saying one nation under God. They don't like it. They even wanted to change the note which says one nation under God. Uh, trust, you know, what does it say on the uh, US dollar? It says trust in God or something, right? Um, we are living in a world where things are very, very difficult. And it's going to get even worse. You know, we are not called to judge people. We are called to love people. But we are called to judge sin. In fact, look at your Bibles. I did not say that. Um, verse 10. Uh, okay, read from verse 8. It says, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful darkness, deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. Expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. So let me tell you, you might think this, you know, Nibbana Chachan is maybe, you know, being very inconsiderate. I can tell you, I have gay friends. I have gay friends. I have lesbian friends as well. But that does not diminish my witness to tell them about the love of Christ. That does not diminish to stand up for what I believe. I travel with them in the same car. I, try, I, I work with them very closely. You know, and it gives me the opportunity to share the love of God and to and to always point back to the scripture of what it tells in the scripture. They don't need to, you know, completely agree with me on everything. That's fine. But we are called to be the light. God, God is going to hold you and me accountable for how we have been knowing the gospel and not talking about it. To him that is given much much will be expected. It's a challenge, guys. And you and I cannot do it in our strength. And this is why he's given us the Holy Spirit, the helper. He will help you. Do, we are not to feel intimidated or, oh, now what am I going to do? I have to share this. I, don't go on a guilt trip. Go into prayer and say, Lord, help me. Help me to be a witness for you. Right? So darkness is death. Only Christ can resurrect those dead in Christ by his uh, power. One of my mentors, he told me this and uh, it is so powerful. Nibin, you are not expected to be a savior. There's only one savior, Jesus Christ. And what does that mean? You and I are meant to sow the word of God in people, to live uh, the uh, Christ before them, to pray for them. But it is the Lord who draws people. So, you and I are not meant to convert anybody. But if a person is willing to open up to the gospel, you and I have that extreme privilege of leading that person to the Lord, right? Of, of uh, praying with them. But you and I are not meant to be saviors. And this is important, right? Only Christ, he said, arise, O sleeper, and uh, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine his light on you. Right. So I want you to go back and read these things. Romans 6, 23, right? The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Light naturally exposes hidden things in darkness and is truly the source of true life. 
you know, I watch documentaries and it tells that if Earth was not in its position where it is today, there would be no life on Earth. The way we are not able to breathe the things that we can breathe. God created that perfect avenue for it. All right. So this is a favorite verse I like, right? Arise and shine. Your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen on you. Isaiah 61. Right. And what does it say after that in verse two? It says, behold, gross darkness has covered the people. Gross darkness, dense darkness has covered the people. But the glory of the Lord shall rise upon you. And the glory of the, and the light of the Lord will shine through you. So why am I saying this? We are living in a time where there's great darkness. People are without hope. You know, things that people trusted would keep them have suddenly been shaken out. And this is where you shine if, because if your hope is in Christ, you can say, brothers, there is an indestructible hope, unshakable hope that we have in Christ. My supply is not based on the market in this world. It is according to his riches and glory. Hallelujah. Amen. So let's keep going. Check your six. How many of you have heard this word? Right? It's a military word. So let me see if there's anybody, anybody going. Check your six. Check your six. Okay. So check your six is something that they use in the military to say, keep your eyes behind. What you can't see um, in this image, actually, you can see a, a jet, you know, firing a missile. But um, the end of the picture is there's another aircraft where one part of the engine is burning because obviously it couldn't deflect or, you know, ward off that uh, heat seeking missile, right? Check your six. And this is what Paul is saying over here in verse 15. He says, therefore, be careful how you walk not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Have your guards up. You know, when you go for wrestling or if you're learning martial arts, we'll say, have your guards up, but then plan your attack. Have your guards up, right? They will teach you that. Um, Second Timothy 2, 3 and 4, it says that we are called to endure hardship as a soldier. We are not to keep our guards down. God has called us into this special military boot camp as his army. You are his army. This is not your home and the world is not your friend. Where do we know that? Hebrews 13, 4, if, uh, 13, 14, it says, you and I do not have a lasting home here. Our home is with him in his presence in the new Jerusalem. What are we doing? What are we investing into? You know, just think about this. When we go up to heaven, it's not about the measure of works. You're only going to get in by the recommendation of the lamp, by the blood, and by the guarantee of the Holy Spirit into heaven. But once you're there, how many people have come to the Lord through your life? I'd rather ask that question here today than us to be wondering when we stand in the presence of God. Ask and challenge ourselves this question. What are we sending up as materials there for the, you know, uh, Paul said, you can have many materials. You can have wood, you can have hay, you can have silver, you have gold. But things have to stand the test of fire, the test of motive. If we are building our own kingdoms, that's not going to stand the fire. It will burn off. So what are we building? Is our house going to stand? Is our pack of whatever that we are building, is it built for the glory of God? Are we leading other people to Christ? Are we investing? Are we praying for others? Do you know that counts? It says your father who sees what you do in secret will reward you openly. It's not fancy to pray for other people in the quietness of your home. There's so many other things we can do. You know, there are so many COVID patients. There are so many people that are out of jobs. There are so many people that are struggling. You know, we have one of our dear friends 
a metal who's taking treatment? How much are we praying? Are you praying for your brothers and sisters in this Zoom meeting? Let's take, check your six. Check your six. Are we taking the time to watch our friend, the wingman? Are we keeping an eye out for them? Don't get sloshed with the world and its enticement. I didn't put it there. It actually says here, uh, verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. You know what happens to people that are sloshed? What do you think? Do they speak sense? In some, in some cases, you may think that they speak a lot of things that was there in them, but it never is an edifying thing, right? My friends, I trust that God will speak to you in this area because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are not living in a legalistic world, but if Christ is truly dwelling in your heart, be sure what you put in there. Be sure what you put in the temple. It's got to be holy. Because if the temple of the Lord had holy things that was, you know, that was sanctified with the blood, it says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Whether it be food, whether it be drinks, please be careful. Because we are all going to bear account on these. What we did with the temple of God is important. Spirit-filled life will result in fellowship with uh, fellow believers in worship. How excited are you and I when we come to the Zoom meeting? Let's say that we didn't have a song. Do you still feel fully engrossed in his presence? Are you excited to be in his presence? You don't expect to come into a meeting and get that. There are times you get encouragement but we need to be bringing our relationship into the fellowship. That's why it says, but be filled with the spirit, singing to one another in spiritual songs and hymns. And you know, it says something very beautiful, making music in your heart. You know, you've seen little children, they make their own songs. Some are really stupid songs, right? They make up their own words and they just sing with their own tune. They're in their own world. Why? Because there's, there is an element of joy in them. That's how God created us. We need to be so filled with the spirit that we can rejoice in the spirit. Making music when you're in your bathroom, when you are in your car, when you are in the kitchen, when you are in your living room. You know, when, uh, you know a person who is betrothed, like they are engaged, there are moments of euphoria, right? You end up listening to all these romantic songs that sort of thrill you and, uh, you know, everything. And then every song you listen, you're imagining, oh, wow, if I sing this and you, you start creating songs, right? Maybe. Or maybe you just pick a song and sing that. But here's something. Are you so excited about Jesus that it is making music in your heart? It doesn't have, you don't have to care about the tune. It is bubbling inside of you. I just love Jesus, what he's done in my life. I can't help it, but sing of his grace. You know, it's, it's just, being, just being so real, just being excited about Jesus, right? All right, thankful and a reverent heart. So you have been given more than you've asked. Don't take it for granted. Give thanks to the Lord. Remember Israel. Remember how many people have still not received the gospel in spite of Jesus being a Jew in, on earth. Remember Israel. Be careful that you have been called, adopted as children. Even though the covenant was given to Abraham and by natural seed it's Israel, you and I have been partakers of that precious covenant where God said to Abraham, I am your great reward. All right. So there are two more parts. We're going to um, look at this. So hello, love. Okay. So you might be thinking, what on earth is this guy doing? So I think the picture speaks for itself and the verb is there, right? It's about marriage. Some of you might be preparing to get into marriage. 
uh, you know, grooming yourself, eligible bachelors, eligible, eligible uh, spinsters. I was going to say splinters, sorry, spinsters. Okay. Um, here's the thing, right? God has said that husband should take an active role and leadership in leading and bringing the family under Christ headship. It is not up to the wife to lead the family in worship. You are the high priest of the home. You are the high priest of the house. What are you doing? You know, you might, uh, the, in certain meetings, you'll find the proportion of women is greater for that meeting than the proportion of men for that meeting. It's very natural in our culture as well. Why? Because, oh, no, you and I are not abdicated from that role of being the spiritual leader of our home. Take it very seriously. You be the one to lead your home in prayer. You be the one to call for worship. You're the one to anchor your family together in the presence of God to worship. That is Christ's design for a home. Wives ought to submit to the husbands as the God-given authority and honor his role as the leader in the home as Christ is to the church. I think it's very important. You know, we live in a world where uh, gender equality is so much there. I am absolutely cognizant of these things. And we need to have equality. But in a home, the way God created family was where the wife submits to the husband as the God-given authority. And look at the last word over there, as Christ is to Christ. That's a big, tall order for the husbands. Your wives can only submit to you if you, if you are able to represent Christ at home. See, Paul is bringing it down to the day-to-day -day living because this is not a pie in the sky. It's living that heaven word, new man in life on earth, in your day-to-day -day living. And how does, he, how does he teach us that, right? The husband can only have real love through Christ. This is the agape love of God. This is not the emotional rush. The physical attraction, all of those things are legitimate within marriage. But the binding factor is the agape love of God. It is the love of God that is poured out in your heart. You are not seeking to be completed in your wife. You are complete in Christ. And in you both being together, you are fulfilling God's purpose in your life. There's a difference between that. I hope you sort of caught what I'm saying. It's okay. If some of you are not yet married, you guys need to all know this, right? Loving the wife is loving himself back. Both are one. Where does it say that? If you look at, if you open your Bible, it says in verse 33, 533, nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects the husband. Verse 29 reads this way, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as also Christ does the church. Here's another thing. It says in verse 26, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. How do you and I treat a spouse? So this is the question that it comes to, right? It's an uncomfortable conversation if you have challenges and it's good to challenge each other. How is our relationship? Do we love a wife as much as we love ourselves? That is the standard that God is saying here, that we are to love her because you are essentially one. You're one. What you see matters. You know, 
I can tell you that there are times that I have absolutely regretted some things that I've spoken in anger. But God has learned me, taught me, and continues to teach me to condition my tongue. Because what you say to your wife can build her or destroy her. You're destroying your own body. Your own body. Nobody else. You know, there is a saying, uh, Let me tell you, you are the body of Christ. If one part gets hurt, the whole body hurts. It's, it's how God designed it to be. And Jesus, by the washing of the water of the word, wants to present the church blameless and pure. Our goal is to build our spouse. Build our wife in the Lord. Build, encourage her, appreciate her, love her. And that's what is taught to us in Ephesians. Support her. Satan wants to sow seeds of discord to destroy this balance. And destroy God's blueprint for the church and the family. You know, the church begins at home. And he has been at it from the beginning. Just think about what Satan did. Who did he tempt? Eve. If Eve followed the God model, right? What should she have done? I'm going to ask you guys. This is a question. What do you think if Eve followed the God model, what would have happened? What, what would have happened? Anybody? Take us. Everyone's very quiet. Did there I put would, everyone to sleep? There would be no sin. Uh, they could have sinned, but there could have been something Eve could have done. She could have consulted with Adam. Yeah, Adam. Adam. Consulted with Adam, right? They are partners. They are one body. Imagine such an important decision what God told them not to touch, not to eat. At that moment, you know, instead of, instead of maybe we see, you know, we don't want to take things out of the context of the word, but if she had actually submitted herself to her husband, she would have called Adam and said, Adam, this guy is actually telling us to eat the fruit. What do you think about it? What is Adam's response? We will never know. But it could have been an opportunity where they could have kept themselves in check. Correct? Likewise, in the husband and the wife, right? Even the husband checking with the wife and saying, hey, you know, there are, there are things that when, you know, we are praying over something, we will share and say, let's pray over it together. You know, that's why Jesus said, if two or three agree regarding anything together and ask in my name, shall be done by my Father in heaven. It was keeping the family in mind. It was keeping the husband and wife in mind. Because if you agree regarding something and say, Father, this is, we believe this is your will and we stand firm on your word. See, it is that balance what Satan immediately targeted. He knew if he could get Eve to deflect in a moment, Adam also could fall. It could be the other way around too. Right? So remember, he has been at this job from the beginning. We are not meant to be enemies of each other. We are not meant to destroy each other, to berate each other, put each other down. We are called to build. All right. So we're coming. Guys, I, I apologize. I know I'm going a little over today, but this is a big portion. Uh, the next one hopefully should be more lighter, but let's go. So trust and obey, right? Obedience in the Lord. This is important. And again, I've underlined for you in the Lord. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. I'm sure this is one of the memory verses that you had to learn in Sunday school right at the get-go. Let me hear a amen, right? <laughs> and we all know the verse also after that, it says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. How many of you have quoted that to your parents? <laughs> or tried to quote it to your parents if you were successful? <laughs> okay, this is important, right? In Luke 2.51, Jesus submitted himself to his parents. 
do you know, even when he was uh, caught in the temple, speaking to the priest, that was his actual home in all reality, right? He was the son of God. And yet when his parents came, what, what, where were you, Jesus? Jesus didn't say, uh, oh, you know, you have not even, you don't even have an idea who I am. Is that what he said? No, he said, don't you know I would be in my father's house, but I am going to obey. And he submitted himself. It didn't say that after Jesus went back to Nazareth, he started teaching his parents how to, uh, you know, I created trees. I know to make uh, carpentry. He didn't do that. He learned of his father. He submitted to the authority. Imagine the son of God for 30 years never did a thing, but submitted himself to his parents' authority. Took responsibility at home. Guys, sometimes that witness, not sometimes, it always starts at home. Perfect your witness at home. That's what Paul is saying here. Perfect your witness at home. Now I'm going to bring something very important here. If your parents love the Lord, then trust their judgments even when you may disagree. See, I'm not trying to speak again something that's like a pie in the sky. How many times if you wanted to go for a meeting, your parents were in the ponda. Especially you are like in the nyam ponda. You know, I want to go. I, this meeting is important. And in all genuineness, this might be important. Alingi, there might be some other, um, you know, thing. Maybe it is your uh, catch up with your friends, harmless, good friends. But your parents say no. Or it could be something else. I, I'm just thinking of you. You can imagine those things that you have disagreements with your parents over. I don't need to help you with that. Right? So let me ask you. How do you respond to them when you, when you are challenged or when you're asked to submit to the authority? There, what if times that they are wrong, right? There can be times our parents are not perfect people. They, in their best of their circumstances, are trying to raise each of us. So question is, how do you and I respond to that? Even when you have, uh, even if you have a disagreement, First Timothy chapter five, verse one, it says, speak respectfully, appealing to the older person as you would to the father. So to your own father, you need to be speaking with much respect, honor, not chastising him, not speaking sharply with him. That's what Paul told Timothy. And that same applies to us. Let Christ in the word be our standard, how we respond to our family members. All right? Arguments and fights with them, even on noble things, loses the essence of the argument. You know, I, I have come across many things and sometimes it's sad. There are times parents don't make right choices. There are parents who don't, uh, you know, uh, hear God and they may do some things that are wrong. They might be sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. And in those times, it's not for you to have a full-blown argument and, you know, try to prove your point, beat them down with the Bible. That's not your job. You, you are to speak your heart to your parents openly, frankly, in love. Again, the goal is love. And then pray over it. Because all homes are not the same. I recognize that. And we need to ensure that we help our brothers who are going through that difficulty, encourage them in the same thing, right? So last, we are coming to the last portion and this is, no, second last portion. So this is your responsibility as dad and moms. Don't we want to get back to our parents, right? <laughs> Some of the young guys there, yeah. So how do parents provoke their children to anger? I, some of the things I've written here, comparison, hurtful words, fits of anger. You know, in the fits of anger, what all comes out of the mouth? The same thing that we just heard, right? Lying to them, lying to them. Sometimes we want to hide something and we just want to appear it to be true just so that we don't hurt the children. Or maybe it can even be that they are trying to cover up their own. Fighting in front of them. This is a husband, uh, parents fighting in front of children. 
it creates an anger towards one of the parents. Polarizing your kids. Oh my gosh, this is really bad. When one parent tries to get the affection of one child by putting down the other's, uh, other spouse. That's not God. You are one. You are one. I, I, I don't know how many of you are actually married with children here, but I, some of you are. And if you're going into marriage, this is something you need to know. And openly fretting about them. Oh, Avanini and Do Chame. Oh, Avani, either the part of 80% of the kids, every admission get done. It's a dream, even a tuition with the team in the Thalil, Uru Kundon Keri Lillo. You know, all these kind of comments you have, yeah, openly fretting about them. So the question is, how as parents can we bring them up in the Lord? See, there are comparisons. You know, I am very fortunate by the grace of God of not having a parent who pitted me against another person. And I'm grateful for that. But I do know friends of mine who had had to struggle with that, even with their own siblings. And that has really marred them, scarred them. No, when we bring them up in the instruction and counsel of God, it is to tell the children, you're unique in Christ. Chapter one and chapter two covers that. That's why I put it there. Edifying words, right? We talked about that instructed word. How can you speak words that are meant to build your children? Even when we are correcting children, I am a huge proponent. Maybe it might not be popular. Using the rod has helped me. It has not diminished my love for my parents. It has only helped me. It has told me there's a red line in my home. And many homes, I see this today, where parents feel so guilty about not being able to spend time with their children that they don't discipline them because they feel obliged to give in to anything and everything they ask. No. It is important to say no, but that can also be edifying if you put it in the right context. Anger in love, not hate. Right? We talked about it, 426. Chapter 4, verse 26. Be honest about your struggles. You are one body. You don't have to lie about things. You know, if there's anything, if parents have been open about their struggles, I could tell you all those things that my parents have been open about with me. I have struggled to understand at times, but over time I have developed a great deal of respect for their honesty and being upfront with me. It has helped me to appreciate things. Disagree privately, love and affirm, openly as unified parents. Don't put down your spouse in front of others. Don't you ever do that. God has not given you the right to do that. Christ never put down his church. He died for her. And pray for them openly in love. Every time Paul prays, he said, I'm praying for you guys. I'm praying for you. You know, I'll be very honest with you, and I'm sharing this. Um, when I was not with the Lord, I would hear my mom praying, and I'm telling you, it irked me to the core because every time it felt like I was being targeted. Katavi, you change his mind, you change his heart, and you know, and my mom used to pray three times a day. So in the morning before I leave to school, um, so I used to be in a morning shift. Then when I come back from school, she's sitting there praying. It's about the right time when mom prays for me as well. It just happens. And then I go to my room and shut the door. And then in the evening, in the night, prayer. so it took me time to understand why they were praying for me. But I then understood it was done in love. Don't, but also I want to tell you this. Don't pray to make a point. You know, some of us are very good at that. No, we are not going to be able to do that. We are not going to be able to do that. That's not what we are called to do. We are called to love. We are called to pray with the Holy Spirit. To pray in the Spirit. When you pray in the Spirit, things happen. When you pray in the Spirit, things happen. When you pray in the Spirit, things happen. When you try to pray in the flesh, it's going to fall flat on its face because it's not even pleasing to God. Right? So, 
we're coming to your engagements workwise right employee work with your heart this is your readily available market witness to christ you know many people will say i want to go for uh, i want to go to missions i want to go and preach the gospel wonderful praise god if god has called you to do it do it but what are you doing about where you are today working there are people around you who do not know christ how do you live honoring the lord in your work now the thing i want to talk about is stop complaining about your company you know i <clears throat> i know people um when they get paid fully but there is a lot of workload because people are you know going through a time where a lot of people the, the workload is more because less people are there they complain about that and then when they're getting full salary they they don't think about that but when there is a pay cut we talk about that and then we forget that we still actually have a job and then we complain about the work environment we have and then we progress to praying about uh, uh, complaining about all the other things i mean if you want to complain that's what you can do all day long you are not in a perfect world my friend wake up but you can be a witness for christ where you are pray for your company how many of us actually take time to pray for our company to bless our company to pray that they prosper because their prosperity also means your prosperity right in the sense that if the company is doing well you will get paid your salary are you doing that god calls us to do that and set the standard of excellence you know i had a friend tell me this and there's nothing that broke my heart more than this there's a friend who actually owns a business and he does not hire christians he says they take them take him for a ride this is uh, you know um a friend's friend so the guy basically has had very bad experiences with christians who come in and they just because they are members of the same church they are taken for granted no all the more sincerely we are to work knowing that we are brothers in christ that we are expected to display our humility and submission in our work in excellence daniel chapter 6 3 3 to 4 it says the guy was so excellent in his work that he was put in responsibility more than others they couldn't find a fault with him are you excellent about your work please don't use your work time to sit and chat about things about church and think that that is ministry that's not your business when you are in work you are paid for every single hour that you are counting on take it seriously work with your heart unto the lord that is ministry too and you know something that really bothers me and i don't want anyone to feel bad about this but i see so many people that have you know come in and they feel so entitled to their position i deserve this you know i've got the degree i have got this certification i have this skill i deserve this job and anything that falls short of it enik itre undaitum enik ide ketti ullu yeah I, i and i'm not judging anybody i have been in that place but it's a very dangerous place god humbled me you know i did my degree here in 2001 i did it i graduated out skyland university my dad had to peel his pocket to pay but i never ended up with a job that really paid well i worked for 3 years in a brainless scanning job which many times i would be like is this why i studied here there would be times that thought came but you know what god in his faithfulness taught me to spend more time with him a lot of the songs that you know god gave me is during those times even what we sing today some of them how many of you know the song korea lies on right so that is a song that god gave me when i was going through that hardship I want to thank you it was a song that came through during that time 
let us remember that God has placed us. And Psalm 75, 6, 7, sorry guys, I really apologize, I'm going a little over, but I, I really want to finish this so that we focus on the next. I want you to think about all that God has done, all that God has done in your life. Psalm 75, 6 and 7 says, promotion does not come from the east or the west, north or the south, but it comes from the Lord. Hallelujah. He puts down people, he exalts people. You know, you might think nobody is noticing you, but that's exactly what we read in Ephesians 6. It says that work in your heart unto the Lord for he will reward you in due time. Let's, let's just read it for the making sure that we understand it. Verse 6, chapter 6, verse 6, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good, with good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, that he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. You're going to receive from the Lord, bros. Some of you I know are standing in faith over his job. Let us all stand in faith, believing that God is the one who gives it. He is prepared. He will provide. He will never change. You know, there's the words of that song. I have, I have never found him to be unfaithful. Hallelujah. His word prevails. Okay, so you are a manager, owner. This is what he tells you. Respect your co-workers and team members. Because God has loved you. He did not push his position on you. His position was meant to serve. Be open and transparent in your dealings. Do not try to hide. And if you are a manager, be very open and willing to teach other people also. Some people, oh, you know, I, I can tell you, I've heard so many times, you know? No. I believe that God has given me the job and if I have to train, I want to make sure that that person has access to everything that I have learned because it is God who gave it to me. And if God wants to move me to another, he will. He does not allow, he does not call us to walk in fear. He calls us to walk in faith. Don't play politics. Partiality and favoritism is the main culprits in many organizations. Don't be a part of it. Don't even stand for the right side, you know. Oh, you know, this guy is doing right. No, stay away from it. Stay away from it. It is God who judges. You serve a God who judges impartially. Every word we speak, we are accountable for. Be humble knowing it's God who has placed you. And in both situations, do not be ashamed of your witness. Be bold in the circumstances, even now, to tell your employees, God is able to provide. He will make a way. And as an employee, you must be willing to tell your boss, I believe God will bless us. I know that God will take us through this difficult time. Learn to be bold in your convictions. And this is all really what it comes down to, guys. So it looks like we went chapter one and two was like a real high when it came to, you know, all the different things that we were uh, seeing in the person of Christ excited us. But now it comes to living it out. It's where the reality hits the ground. And how do we live that identity? I really pray that this blessed you. You know, we have come to the, definitely the last part of this. Think and pray over these things. Do you feel compelled to trash talk to fit in? Are we willing to be unashamed for Christ and live unapologetically in our new identity? What are the things that I'm going to labor and love to honor the Lord? Things at home. Guys, pick up your plates. Pick up your undergarments. Wash it. Do it as you do it to the honor the Lord. Do what you guys have to do. Spend time with the word. Don't just listen to others. Take time. Are there areas in my life that is hidden before the Lord? Have I yielded every area to the Holy Spirit? 
How is my family relationships? What are areas that I need to work on that will help my witness within my home? And lastly, does my work ethics reflect Christ to others? Guys, I tremendously appreciate your patience. I know we had a lot to cover today because we were spanning three chapters. And that's a lot of content, but I, you can't separate one from the other. And I hope you really take time to read this and pray over this again. And I don't know if we have time for questions, but um, we're well over time, I know. I'm, again, very sorry that we have taken this time, but wanted to make sure that we cover this. Um, our next session, obviously,